Hello everyone, my name is Primitiva. Welcome back to another episode of Speculative Evolution Project Pokemon, a series where we analyze Pokemon's their biology, their body plan, and how they live. Now with that information, we grab an animal, either alive or extinct, and we let it take a hypothetical path, and where it would evolve into something that matches a Pokemon as closely as possible. It's important to remember that Pokemon are magical creatures, meaning that some traits might be impossible to recreate in real life, although I will definitely try. Last time we looked at the Venusaur line, so if you haven't seen that one, I strongly suggest checking it out. But today, we're going to be focusing on Charmander, Charmeleon, and Charizard linked together as one animal. And with that out of the way, I'm not going to waste anyone's time, let's get right into the episode. What's interesting about this line is that they have multiple inspirations, just like the Venusaur line. However, this time none of them are based on prehistoric animals. Charmander is based on a lizard, which is obvious, but it also shares inspirations from salamanders in mythology. And these salamanders resemble lizards more than their actual kind. There's even a real salamander that's called the fire salamander. And that's just so cool. Or should I say hot? Unfortunately, the salamander inspiration just kind of stops as it evolves into Charmeleon, and now it's just a bipedal lizard. As it turns into Charizard, it's quite obvious. It's a dragon, specifically the European dragon. It's not a dragon type, but fire and flying makes sense for a dragon too. I mean, they fly and they spew fire, so yeah. A small fire lizard like Salamander turns into a European dragon. This is kind of a cool idea because they did this actually on purpose so that kids wouldn't really figure out that Charmander was going to evolve into Charizard. However, I do think that the Venusaur line had some cooler ideas. And that could have to do with the fact that I'm very biased towards prehistoric designs though, but who knows. One thing that would have been cool to see with this line though is it keeping some of that Salamander-like inspiration that Charmander had. I mean, after all, when you think of amphibians, you know, they're meant to stay in the water. But if it's one that flew around and spew fire, I mean, that would have been like super cool and not expected whatsoever. Moving on from their inspiration, what about their canonical biology? Well, a lot of biology surrounding these Pokemon is about their strength, their fire, and the flame that's on their tail. It's said that if this flame were to go out, it would die, which seems, I don't know, really inconvenient and confusing to me. This is like the complete opposite of the Venusaur line. I mean, with that one, it had like the dual symbiosis going on and stuff, you know, having multiple sources of energy. But this one just seems like a hindrance, like the tail flame is just weird. Something that is cool about the flame, however, is that it shows the emotions of the Pokemon. So luckily it's not all bad, and the line does canonically get stronger the further it's in its evolutionary line. Although it's much more aggressive when it's a Charmeleon, like an angsty teenager, its personality is very barbaric using its now enhanced sharp claws and tail to win battles, and can only be calmed down if it does. When it evolves into Charizard, it seems to lose this anger. It seems that Ashes was just an exception. Most of its personality now revolves around pride, as it's stated that it doesn't like using its fire at all when facing weaker opponents, and that it just flies around looking for battles. Oh, and that its fire is now intensely hot, and can apparently melt everything. Its tail flame also burns hotter when it experiences more harsher battles. And when furious, the tip lights up in a bluish white fire. You know, I wonder if that inspired Charizard X. Charizard is also known for sometimes causing forest fires unintentionally. You know, that doesn't sound too good. We're gonna need some animal control in this thing. And then it's also supposed to fly as high as 4,600 feet, which I find rather hard to believe with those wings but trust me, I'll get into that. I'm sure that these Pokemon, just like the Venusaur line, are rather solitary, and keep to their own usually, unless it's time for the good old DNA sharing. And um, well, that's about it. It's not as interesting or detailed as Venusaur's, I'll admit, but hey, it's still cool. But now, it's time to move on to the speculative evolution itself. Finding a suitable ancestor for this line shouldn't be much of a problem at all. After all, it's pretty clear that they are reptiles, and there's loads of cool reptiles around or extinct, and the diversity that reptiles can reach is honestly astounding. Just look at crocodiles, pterosaurs, and of course, dinosaurs. However, one problem that immediately comes to mind when thinking of this line is 
Charizard. Now, if you know anything about biology or how an animal's body plan works, you might notice the issue right away. Charizard is a hexapod, which is an animal with six limbs, but it's also a vertebrate. And I hate to tell you all, but a vertebrate animal with six limbs, it's not really realistic, at least on our planet. It's not entirely impossible. Say that we had a six-limbed ancestor instead of four, but it probably wouldn't have lived very long. There's, after all, a reason that we have four limbs. Six would simply be too much. More limbs means more weight, along with more energy consumption. Sure, there would be benefits like a wolf having two extra limbs to grab prey, but overall the negatives just outweigh the positives. I did say that hyperspecific evolution might be necessary, but I think a hexapod vertebrate is just not possible, even under those circumstances. Especially if it flew, taking even more energy. And even if it did exist, it would always get outcompeted by the more adapted tetrapods. This will mean that Charizard will be a tetrapod. Sorry y'all, I know a lot of you probably really really love the classic European dragon design, as do I, but it isn't realistic, and I just strive to be realistic with this series. So, now that we have that well needed explanation out of the way, who will be its ancestors? Well, I decided on the Archosaurs. You know, those pesky little rulers of the Mesozoic. There are two clades of Archosauria, Avametatrosalia, which contains everything closer to birds than the crocodiles, such as pterosaurs and dinosaurs. Then the other way around is Pseudosuchia, which contains everything that's more closer to crocodiles than to birds. And I'll be putting Charizard in the first one. So awesome, that means that Charizard is going to be a dinosaur, right? No. I'm going to make this line's ancestors something that's distantly related to dinosaurs. Also a group of animals that I'm sure most people don't even know about. Meet the Aphanosaurs. These animals are some of the oldest and most primitive known clade of Avametrosalia, sharing traits from both this group and the Pseudosuchians, such as their ankles, which are more crocodilian-like, showing us that the ankles of later Avametrosalians were not the norm in the beginnings of their evolution. What's also cool about these animals is that they were just discovered in 2017. They superficially resemble lizards, but their closest modern relatives are birds. Shows you how much you can't rely on appearances. We, for example, are more related to lungfish than sharks or to tunas. You wouldn't think that at all, but hey, biology just be like that sometimes. Back to Aphanosaurus. These animals come from the Middle Triassic period, but they didn't live very long, only about 10 million years, from the Anition stage to the Ladinian. These animals were rather slow quadrupedal long-necked carnivores, and a biology more similar to basal archosaurs, rather than more advanced members of their clade, such as pterosaurs and early dinosaurs. However, their growth rate was much more like birds than any other reptile, meaning that they grew quickly, which is certainly a nifty advantage to have. There's only four genera discovered so far, and there's not a whole lot of information about these animals, so figuring out which specific genus will evolve into the Charizard line is a hard. But nonetheless, I chose these animals for a reason. I thought that maybe pterosaurs could be a good fit as well, but they have beaks, and these Pokemon clearly don't. Unfortunately though, as far as my research went, I couldn't find any information on how they exactly became extinct. They arrived and died in the Middle Triassic, so what could have possibly happened? Well, it's possible that they were just outcompeted by other carnivores. Other Avametrosalians were just better at it, really. So let's assume that instead of staying this way, they become more bipedal, just like dinosaurs, which was a great adaptation. The way proto-dinosaurs evolved bipedalism was because of their tail, which had very powerful muscles that helped power their hind legs to run faster and longer, while their forelimbs became shorter and lighter. This was to reduce body weight and increase balance and agility. Carnivorous dinosaurs kept this and kept improving on it, while herbivorous dinosaurs became more quadrupedal and evolved defenses like size or body armor instead of speed. This won't happen immediately though, oh no, it will be very gradual throughout the Triassic, starting out with using their forelimbs to grab and attack prey. They'll also evolve to grow even faster, allowing for quicker reproduction which is generally good when you're under extreme pressure. Their size will also change, as they'll become smaller. This is good from hiding from their scarier dinosaur cousins. It definitely won't be a top predator at all, 
but it'll make do by hiding in the shadows until it's time for the end Triassic extinction event. So that's fun. I missed out some details regarding this extinction last time because it could be very hard to find out the exact cause. Many scientists say that it's because of climate change and rising sea levels, which came from a sudden release of huge amounts of carbon dioxide. This in turn was due to the widespread volcanic activity caused by Pangaea breaking up, increasing air temperatures and acidifying the oceans. It also affected land, but not as hard. And luckily, archosaurs didn't take much hits at all. In fact, it's likely that this extinction opened up a lot of terrestrial niches, allowing archosaurs to take over rapidly. So, in our scenario, Aphanosaurs will take advantage of this extinction event, and the event happens a bit differently. Any group of animals can die from an extinction event. It's just sometimes luck that some survive. So, if this event steered Aphanosaurs more favorably, then we have a good head start. Archosaurs like pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and most of our familiar friends will still be there. I can't of course say which ones will, that's almost impossible to determine, but the conditions will be very good for Aphanosaurs to diversify and take on all kinds of niches. They'll definitely be carnivores, evolving to become even more bipedal and faster, and using their front arms along with their newly evolved stronger claws to grab and damage prey. To picture them, imagine a dromaeosaur. You know, the raptors. But instead of using a sickle claw on their feet, it'll be multiple fingers on their forearms. It'll be weaker, but deadly in combination while slashing. This happens pretty fast because of our good old friend, adaptive radiation. And they become one of the primary small to medium sized carnivores running around in the early to middle Jurassic. But in the middle Jurassic, there's a special group of aphanosaurs that's grown through a big, big transition. And that is an arboreal lifestyle. Through their now extended limbs and specialized claws, they can climb trees and grab onto branches. These trees are used for hunting and hiding away from ground predators, which are much, much larger than them, as most of these tree dwelling aphanosaurs aren't bigger than two meters long and one meter tall. Snacking on any animal they can find and maneuvering themselves from branch to branch, these animals are close to something really, really special. They also gain more hollow bones, similar to other avometric dorsalians, as a lighter weight is generally good when you're supporting yourself on trees and moving from branch to branch. Because they're not under extreme pressure anymore, their growth rate, aka how fast they grow up, will return to a more normal rate, and this will continue for the species in the future. These animals will be known as the transitional Dracosauromorphs, meaning dragon lizard morphs. Now it's time for some time travel. We're now in the late Jurassic and our focus goes back on those same Athanosaurs, but this time they've obtained something really special. In fact, they've evolved a patagium, which is the membrane that extends between their forelimbs, allowing them to glide throughout the forest. They mainly feed on other tree dwelling animals, such as bugs and small vertebrates, but also anything that they can find on the ground which they can strike from above and deliver a killing blow with their claws. An animal that I'd like to bring up as an example is Yi Chi, a gliding dinosaur from the middle to late Jurassic. This theropod, unlike its other bird-like relatives, has grown a wing-like structure that is not made up of feathers, but instead membrane, similar to bats and pterosaurs. It likely was specialized for gliding instead of flight, but if it stuck around for a bit longer or went into a different direction, who knows what could have happened. Yi Chi was a huge inspiration, because it shows that membranous wings can appear in multiple archosaurs, and not just pterosaurs. Over time, the wing-like structures on these dracosauromorphs will become even more advanced, and bigger, as to help them traverse through their environment more. And eventually, with a lot of cool evolution and, you know, of course luck, they get to be able to fly. Kinda. They're not very good at it, but they get better with each new generation. Until eventually, we skip forward to the early Cretaceous, and here we are. This is it. The big moment we finally have our Dracosaurs. They have finally evolved powered flight. Only four animals in our timeline have. And through the magic and power of evolution, this creature can now fly. Their wings are very similar to those of bats, just like the wings of the actual Charizard. Like bats, they possess a membrane that stretches from their front limbs to their hind limbs, along with some between their legs. The wings are much bigger than those of the actual Charizard, because let's be real, those are way too small for flight. 
let alone gliding. These wings are extremely similar through convergent evolution. Unlike bats though, their wings are made of three fingers and two for some grasping. The two sticking out resemble the rod Charizard's wings have sticking out. This allows them, like bats, to maneuver more in the air due to the multiple finger joints in the wings. These wings are very powerful and full of muscles used to generate aerodynamic force, allowing these animals to produce lift and thrust. A stronger breastbone is also something that slowly evolved, and these are attached to the wings. Because without strong muscles connecting everything together, you can't fly which again takes a lot of energy. Air sacs fill their bones, becoming even more lightweight. Yet their bones are also powerful, like pterosaurs, with bony structures inside keeping it all together. Their wings are curved, like aerofoil on a plane. That way, air that moves over the top of the wing has to travel further and speeds up, producing less pressure. Meanwhile, the air going below the wing has the opposite going on, which slows down and produces more pressure. Through this, lift is generated. Bigger wings can create more lift, but the downside is more energy consumption when flapping and more stress on the wings. Quetzalcoatlus northropi was the biggest animal that could ever fly, and it was just humongously big, having a wingspan of 10 meters and being 5 meters tall and weighing 250 kilograms. It could soar for a very, very long time without even flapping its enormous wings even once. It was an excellent flyer. And yeah, that's basically a simplified explanation to how flight works in animals. However, flight can't work without proper takeoff, which they actually do similarly to birds and have very strong leg muscles that help them with it. Yet some bigger species might need the help of running before takeoff like albatrosses, or using the wind to their advantage. They're also digitigrades, meaning that they're animals who walk on their toes. This is a generally faster and quieter movement. Some species may opt for using their feet as weapons, or to pick up objects. And their legs will kind of resemble skinny crocodile legs, but they'll be kind of bird-like as well. They've also evolved more bird-like lungs, where air flows into the lungs through one direction. With the help of their air sacs taking in oxygen, they can also take in oxygen while exhaling, which is extremely efficient when you're flying at high altitudes. Birds, and most likely pterosaurs, have this way of breathing, and so will these trachosaurs. Bats can't reach as high, because when mammals breathe, air gets moved back and forth into the lungs, resulting in some mixture of old and new air, and this mixed air has less oxygen. An odd thing that they've also evolved similar to pterosaurs is pycnofibers. Pterosaurs had this fur-like coating on their body, keeping them warm in flight. On top of that, they were also warm-blooded. After all, it gets cold up there. But a study from 2018 found two small pterosaur fossils which were covered in four different types of pycnofibers, and several of these were basically the same structurally as feathers. So yeah, pterosaurs had feathers. Ain't that a cool fact to know? These trachosaurs will have pycnofibers for the same reason resembling feathers of a baby bird, so they'll actually be a little bit fuzzy and warm-blooded on top of that as well. Their tails will be thinner and lighter, but still there on some species, just like the suborder of pterosaurs known as Rampyrinchoroids, and they'll be mainly used for sexual display. They don't possess beaks like birds and pterosaurs do, and have powerful jaws. Most of these species are carnivorous, but some are herbivorous or omnivorous, and the sizes, colors, and niches vary a lot across the group. You can basically find them anywhere. Forests, beaches, open fields, mountains, anywhere you can think of. But before I go into the star of this episode, what the heck's going on with birds? I'm sure some of you are wondering. Birds evolved in the early Cretaceous, but so did these trachosaurs. So what's up? Well, birds basically got outcompeted. It's as simple as that. So animals like Archaeopteryx are basically still stuck gliding. The maneuverability of these trachosaurs allowed them to become one of the most dominant flyers next to pterosaurs in the early Cretaceous. Plus, there have never been more than two flying vertebrates at the same time. So I'm basically going to stick to that rule. Remember, evolution can seemingly go in basically any direction. It plays no favorites, nor does it have any biases. So anything can happen. Going back to Dracosaurus, our attention goes to Black Hills, a mountainous range in North America, and what is now South Dakota, stretching into Wyoming. Here lives a species called Flamus crinus, which means blazing tail in Latin. These Dracosaurs possess a unique tail used for display, 
and unlike others, they are very fluffy and dark orange, like the rest of the animal. Males will have plumage on the tip of their tails, which is red and yellow, and the tail is about 90 centimeters in length. The reason this species is called what it is, is due to the tail, which looks like it's on fire. They also have a pattern on their chest that extends to the underside of their tail that is cream colored, similar to the actual Charizard. Females look the same, minus the plumage on their tails, and the general height of this species when it's standing upright is about 1.7 meters. However, their full length, plus the tail, is about 6.2 meters. I calculated this through using Charizard's cannon height, which is 1.7 meters, and the tail in game is about half of that, so I basically just did the math. Their wingspan is about 5 meters, and the color of their wings on the inside are darkish blue, but the tip of their wings, just like Charizard, are orange. Determining the weight of this animal is really hard, so for reference I looked at Argentavis, the biggest bird that ever flew, and these were its estimate sizes. It primarily soared across the sky because of its size, and so are our animal, so I'm going to estimate that Flamus Crinus will be around 45 to 52 kilograms. This is somewhat lighter, but that's because Argentavis also had larger wings, and was a bit taller on average, and also was longer, at about 3.5 meters, whereas Flamus Crinus is shorter, and the tail is very lightweight. These animals also have tufts of plumage on the top of their head, which is the same color as their body. This allows for intimidation. After all, they're only about 1.7 meters when standing upright. Heck, I'm even taller than these animals, so this helps them avoid predators that might be looking for a snack. And since these are one of the bigger species of trachosaurs, their main method of taking off involves running or using the height of the mountains to their advantage. Obviously, they're also carnivores, but more on that in a bit. So, this small group of archosaurs known as Aphanosaurs has, through luck, survived until the end Triassic, and also survived the end Triassic extinction event. Then they diversified, and through the help of adaptive radiation and a little bit of specific evolution, they became animals that matched Charizard as closely as possible. Of course, as much as real life could allow. But wait, there's one important thing missing. Where's the fire breathing? Well, unfortunately, fire breathing for a flying animal isn't realistic, because flying is already so energy heavy and so specialized. But could a fire breathing animal actually exist in our world? Well, theoretically, maybe? The bombardier beetle is the closest we have to it, which sprays a hot chemical spray from its butt. So a venomous dragon with a burning spray could be possible, perhaps. Another possibility for fire breathing would be for dragons to have a separate organ, like a third lung that stores gases like methane and hydrogen. Then this releases at will from the animal's mouth. However, you need something that will ignite a spark. Something like specialized mineralized teeth, or maybe just even places to hold flint and steel together. And then at the right moment, you ignite the gas and it becomes fire. To prevent any damage to the throat and mouth, there will have to be some kind of mucus surrounding the animal's throat that protects it from the heat. It'd be mainly used for self-defense, but again, it wouldn't be very good on a flying animal. After all, they're in the air a lot, and I can imagine that the wind currents would mess up a lot of that gas that they're spewing back out, and it's not even talking about the energy usage. So, an animal spewing fire? Yeah, theoretically possible, but a flying one? No, it'd be just way too inconvenient, even though I adore the idea. But now, let's move on to the last part, which is about ecology and behavior. Well, here we are. Charizard is now a real animal, everyone. But what about Charmander and Charmeleon? Welp, let's get on with that sexy mating. I'm sure you all have been dying to get to this part. Males try and spoon females with rattling their tails around while tapping their feet. I've based this on the sharp tilled grouse lex mating dance, which is certainly something. Multiple males can show up to spoon one female, and whichever one has the fanciest dance and the fanciest and biggest plumage gets to pass down his genes. Males also have an interesting way of communicating to females. When mating season rolls around, the males have a distinct call, which sounds kind of like this. That's the sound of an ostrich. Crazy, right? I tried finding something that resembled the roar that Charizard makes in the anime, and naturally tried looking at birds. And this is what I came up with. That sort of low growling noise that an ostrich makes. 
Males and females stay together and raise their young. Males build the nests on high places around the Black Hills. Then both parents incubate the eggs and take turns gathering food. The incubation period lasts for about 58 to 60 days, and the eggs are white with brown spots. Since this animal isn't real, I had to look up references, like the Andean condor who also inhabits mountains. The young are born with much more fluff than the adults, and kind of look like fuzzed up Charmanders with no plumage yet, and small underdeveloped wings and teeth. They are brownish orange for camouflage, to protect them in their most vulnerable stage. They need to eat a lot during the first few weeks, so the parents are very busy. After this period, they start to grow much quicker and gain a dark orange fuzz that is thinner, and the creamy underside from their chest to tail is starting to develop. The small intimidation tufts on their head are starting to grow as well, along with their wings being almost ready for flight and having developed teeth and small plumage if they're male, looking very similar to Charmeleon. Although they're still reliant on their parents, they learn to fly slowly and learn about the environment and each other. It takes about three months until they are able to fly, and at this stage they kind of look like a weird mishmash between Charmeleon and Charizard. Then they stay with the parents for about two more months, and then they are fully grown and leave to survive on their own. And then the parents also split up after raising their young after which they reach sexual maturity at around age 3, and the animal's lifespan is around age 36. Mainly solitary creatures, with the exception of breeding season, these animals don't like others coming into their territory. These animals are primarily scavengers, so they spend a whole lot of their time soaring, flapping as little as they can, and looking for carrion. Their eyes are specialized for spotting carrion, along with their sense of smell. Because of this, they can find carrion faster than some land scavengers, and they also eat small prey as well, but they don't like fighting anything bigger, so if a bigger animal is also eating carrion, they try to take a few bites with caution. They do get aggressive when another one of their species, or something smaller, tries to steal their loot though. If forced in a fight, they can puff up their fuzz to make them appear bigger, and confuse the other animals by swinging its tail around. For digesting carrion, they've evolved powerful stomachs, with a high concentration of hydrochloric acid, used for destroying the bacteria before it reaches the intestines, like a filter. They help out the environment by basically being a corpse cleaner, and keeping the mountains and forests more hygienic. Overall, they do good, successful in taking over the scavenger niche and making the forests and mountains of Black Hills their home in the early Cretaceous. The question now is, will they and the other Dracosaurs survive the KPG extinction? And make it to the time in which Merticiatherium, the Venusaur animal, lives. Again, I'll let you all decide on that. And yes, both Merticiatherium and Flamus Crenus are going to be in the same timeline. Let's call it Timeline Alpha for now. I'm going to attempt, and big focus on attempt, to link all of these Pokemon animals in the same timeline. But because Pokemon are, well, crazy sometimes, I don't know how many timelines there will be. And if I go above the 24 Greek numbers, officially passing Omega, well, that's still a long way from now, so who knows what will happen then. Archosaurus like Flamus Crinus still rule over the Mesozoic, while the ancestors of Matisseotherium lived in the shadows, until that changed after the KPG extinction. So yeah, it all holds up pretty well, and we'll see what the future holds. Whew! Well, making Charizard in real life proved to be more unique than I expected, and I had to do a lot of research into flying animals. Like Venusaur, I bet some of you were expecting something different, like Charizard being all scaly and stuff, but nope, instead, I made the adorable, fluffy Charizard. I took a lot of inspiration from other flying animals, which I'm sure was obvious, and basically combined all that knowledge into making this animal. A big thank you to Dylan Baja, he really made these Pokemon into real animals through his amazing skills, and honestly, I couldn't be happier. They look amazing. You may have heard of his name before, if you're in the Spec Evo community. He is the creator of Serena, a natural history of the world of birds. Honestly, me talking about it is not going to cut it at all. You should honestly check it out yourself. It's truly breathtaking. It'll be in the description below. I'd also like to do a shout out to a fan who I met through the Venusaur video, Shin Alpha on Discord. He really helped me out with sharing his knowledge about paleontology and gave me the idea to use the Aphanosaurs as the ancestors for Charizards. I knew I wanted to do something with Avametatrosalians, but wasn't sure how, so thanks a lot. I'm sure that without this help, this script would have taken longer to write. Next up is Blastoise, and oof, 
It was a challenge at first to figure out on what I wanted to do with it, but now I think I kind of got a grip on it. I was very happy with the reception that the first episode got, and I was truly overjoyed that this little ambitious project got so many views, so much more than my other videos. I'll try and provide as much of this series as I can, but at this point I can't promise anything like monthly releases, because the editing and the art, well, it's certainly not cheap. It's definitely worth it, but if I do it monthly, my resources would go down the drain pretty fast. So in case you're feeling generous and want to help me out with this little ambitious project, you can become a Patreon. It's only one buck a month, and there are some pretty sweet prices that are well worth the low price. Patreon is in the description below. Let me know which Pokemon you want to see after Blastoise. Be sure to comment it down below, because your comment and your suggestion will be used on my Patreon, so for those who are already patrons can vote on which one it'll end up being, so that way everyone kind of wins. If you want to see more videos like this, you can check out my fossil Pokemon based series called Paleomon, or you can check out my recent top 5 video, which has some cool facts and inspirations thrown in there. If you like this video, be sure to hit that like button and leave a comment as well. If you want to see more Pokemon content like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button and hit the bell so you get notified whenever I upload a new video. And if you know some people who might be interested in this type of content, be sure to share it with them, as it sometimes can be hard to be noticed on YouTube. Last but not least, I also have a Discord server in case you want to say hi to me, which is also in the description below. And with that being said, I hope y'all have a good day, night or morning, and as always, take care!